years. Um, he was one of Newt Gingrich's most trusted aides and lieutenants. And anyone will tell you when you're trying to win a battle, you need good lieutenants. And Tony was there as his press spokesperson, his idea guy, his wordsmith, uh, a man who sold the contract with America as well as anyone did. And I'm just, he doesn't remember this, of course, but because he's a little older than I am, but uh, back in 1990, I went to Washington to be a press secretary, and uh, I met Tony. Tony had just started working for Newt, and I worked for a congressman, and there was a whole collection of young conservatives who went to Washington who were very eager to change the way the world uh, viewed the Republican Party, and he was a great part of that. Uh, Tony stands apart from many of the people you see on Washington. He's a pundit, as they say. Uh, he was called a, uh, a, a brilliant soothsayer by one, a sooth I can't even say soothsayer, uh, TV Weekend's soothsayer on a, a Brill's Content Magazine scorecard. He's a regular on several syndicated national commercial talk shows both radio and television. Uh, I'm sure you've seen him much on television today. He's going to share some thoughts about where we are as a party, where we need to go, and how we're going to get there. So please, I'll give a good Northeast Republican welcome for Tony Blankley. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I was listening in to the, uh, before lunch to uh, Governor Sununu's speech, and he was getting me going. I was getting more and more excited about our opportunities, until right at the end, he said what we need is warmth and charm <laughs> to uh, sell our, and then I thought, that, well, now we've got a little bit of a problem, uh, but uh, I would, I want to give plenty of time to do Q&A, and, and, uh, uh, and I can sort of ramble on. I wanted to start with a, an optimistic thought, I want to quote uh, just a brief quote, this is from the Financial Times, uh, this morning's Financial Times, and it's quoting uh, the President of the United States when he was giving his pitch in, in um, Denmark. And here's uh, the quote of, of our President. Uh, Nearly one year ago, on a clear November night, people from every corner of the world gathered in the city of Chicago uh, to see uh, the belief that American experiment in democracy still speaks to a universal aspiration. Uh, and then he was trying to pitch uh, why they should go to Chicago after talking about people from the world gathering on a cold night uh, to see his uh, election. And I sort of came to mind as I was reading that was on a cold winter's night that was so deep. <laughs> Noel, Noel. Born as the king of Israel. <laughs> uh, any opposition party, fate starts with how the governing party falls. Our opportunity starts when the public begins to see the shortcomings of the governing party. Uh, then, and the opposition party can help create that impression of the governing party. And the opposition party has to be prepared to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes. But it is, I think, the case that in the absence of the public having some doubts, some serious doubts about the governing party, we probably don't get a chance. I don't think any opposition party gets a real chance to be considered. And sometimes you have to wait a long time. And I think if you'd ask most of us, certainly me, uh, eight months ago, how things were going to look, um, I would not have been too confident that we would have something that might look like a on the path towards a failed uh, or failing uh, majority party uh, so soon. And now I've traveled all over the country, particularly this summer. I went to uh, a number of uh, uh, events with, with the public, um, town halls, tea parties. I did a panel in, um, for, for Republicans whole new created group in, in Steamboat Springs of people, none of them are Republicans, 
by protecting none of them were fundraising. They just decided something, enough was going wrong in the country that they were going to form an alternative to the Aspen Institute. And so they got together. Instead of the fund, you know, the contributors for this group being Microsoft or whatever, it was the local jewelry store owner and the local customer who owns an accounting service. And they pulled together this event, got a few people like me out there to talk, John Fund and a few others. And they filled the hotel with a large room to overflowing uh, and met with these people, spent three days with them. And the energy that was coming out of, of this room, people just choosing to come, people who had not been involved in politics, and suddenly were getting scared that their country was slipping away in some way, started doing what Americans have been doing, as the Tocqueville noted from the beginning. Uh, they start volunteering, they start stepping out, they don't wait for others, they don't wait for official organizations, they start doing it. So, this energy that has been uh, building, that we didn't create, the public party can take no credit for, for having created this. Uh, the government has created it by, this, by their actions and the perceptions of their actions. And that's what I think gives an opportunity uh, to, to present uh, our case to, to the people uh, in 13 months. And I've been struck, I've, if you look at the history of when you have big economic events and what it does to the body politic and to the values, it can be very dramatic in a generational sense. After the uh, panic of 1893 and the depression that followed that, that was the end of, of lazy fair capitalism. That was the end of the Gilded Age. We went into progressivism, we went into uh, antitrust. The public was shocked by an event where they lost their homes, they went out west with nothing because they lost their, everything they had back home, uh, and, and the values of the country changed in the trauma of that shock. It happened again, obviously, in 1929 to 1932. Following on that trauma, the country moved to the left. They wanted the protection of government in a way that they hadn't before. Again, the other way around a little bit, in the 70s, not quite as dramatic, but the failings of liberalism, both cultural and economic, I think brought on Reaganism and Thatcherism, it gave us an opportunity. The public then said they had enough of the excesses of government, now they wanted to experience freedom for a while. And so my fear, and still my concern, that we are having an event, an economic event now, that is of some significant magnitude. The, the reduction in value of assets is affecting almost everyone uh, dramatically. It will change lives. It is changing lives. And it will probably change lives for a good period of time before we bottom out and, and, and got back to a prosperous level. You know, uh, and, so and my concern was that the public might have learned the lesson that too much freedom to, you know, is a dangerous thing and they want the state to protect them. And they certainly have, both in Congress, in the leadership, and in the White House, exactly the right team to offer them uh, a little less freedom, or a lot less freedom, and uh, the uh, illusion of, of, of security. Uh, and, and I think that argument is not yet won by our side, but the first evidence is and, and this is the most hopeful thing I've, I've seen in America in decades, is that the instinctive reaction of the American public seems to have been, this deficit is too big, the government is getting too big, it's going to overwhelm my ability to live my own life, I'm worried about my grandchildren's ability, where they're going to be paying debt on, on this. Then they didn't say, I'm afraid, give me shelter. They said, I'm afraid of the shelter, give me the sunlight. And this gives us an opportunity that is vital because in some ways I think that the Obama election is sort of like the Reagan election. When Reagan ran, and I worked on all of Reagan's campaigns going back to uh, 66 for governor and had the chance to be uh, a speechwriter and other things for him uh, in the White House. Uh, and when we ran in, in, in 80, the country was, had a belly full of Jimmy Carter and the Democrats and they needed to see that Reagan was plausible. It was a low threshold, and he passed it. Now, he had, a lot, he had some vital issues, but my suspicion is that the public was ready to throw out the Democrats uh, as long as they weren't terrified of, of the Republican. When Reagan seemed like a, a regular guy during the debates, and there you go again to Jimmy Carter, seemed like it was okay.